for uh, here for uh, No More Jeans because the second Thursday of every month I uh, do a teaching called No More Genies. Now, I strongly, 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 strongly encourage you to go back to the beginning of the series. You can find it on my Facebook page and you can find it on my YouTube channel. Prophet David Taylor, go back to the beginning of No More Genies and listen from the beginning. This is currently my 26th uh, message um, uh, teaching in No More Genies. But if you really want to understand what I mean when I'm talking about genie concept and when I'm talking about uh, getting away from the genie concept of God so that we can <clears throat> focus in on what the scripture really says, because genie concept, the reason I do this teaching is because genie concept has messed up a lot of people. Genie concept is that thing that when you see those stories of those couples that wouldn't take their kids to the hospital or wouldn't take their kids to see the doctor, then the child ended up dying because they said, no, 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 we're going to pray. Ain't nothing wrong with praying. Ain't nothing wrong with using your faith. You're supposed to use your faith, but maybe you need specialized medical attention. Maybe you need to go to the doctor. Maybe you need some medicine. Maybe that's what the Holy Ghost is telling you. Pray, believe, and go to the hospital. Your faith might not also be at a level because you say, well, the Bible did this and people did this. And I've seen limbs restored. I've seen a woman with her arm bunched up and was bunched all the way up. And I've seen them pour on holy water on her and that arm extended. And I've seen women to where the doctors say they couldn't have kids and a prophet prayed for them and they had kids. So yes, there's divine healing and yes, there's divine miracles, but your faith may not be at that level. Or again, what you need, remember <clears throat> when Jesus called Lazarus back from the dead, they still had to untie him and he still ate. Oh, where's my sister? Let me say hey to my sister. So what I'm saying is that genie concept is that thing that that pulls people away from actual faith, what the Bible actually says, not even actually studying the miracles of Jesus, seeing how the Lord did what he did. OK, how the Lord did what he did. Genie concept is that thing that where people just say no medicine, no time under any circumstances. Where people say no doctors, no hospitals, that's one example where people go to extreme because what they think is that they get to tell God how he has to heal them or that it has to happen a certain way. When you actually study the healings of Christ, he didn't heal people the same way. Some people, their sickness came from unclean spirits, from demons, and he cast them out. Some people, he laid his hands on them. One blind guy, he actually made... Uh, some uh, mud out of spit and dirt and water and all that. And he made a paste and put it on his eyes like Sal. Um, again, some people, he just spoke to them like the uh, 10 lepers. He said, go show yourselves to the priest. Okay. Uh, Lazarus, he just said, Lazarus, come forth and call them back. The damsel whom he, struck, he stopped for a funeral procession. He said, uh, Talitha Kumi, damsel, I say to thee, arise. The Lord actually grabbed her hand and pulls her up. And then there's the woman with the issue of blood. We tell her story all the time. Remember that Jesus was not looking at her. <laughs> Remember that she pushed through the crowd and she grabbed the Lord from behind because the Lord turned around and said, who touched me? And he was in a crowd because his friend said, master, this crowd is pressing on you. They throng you. There's all these people around here. You're talking about who touched me. And the Lord said, no, I felt virtue go out of me. So even studying the, the miracles of Jesus, he didn't do what he did the same way every time. Remember the man that was lame for 38 years, that was laying by the pool, that the angel would come in trouble, where an angel would come from heaven and put healing water in that pool. But the way that miracle worked was the first person, the first person to get to the pool was the person that received the healing. Now, why did it work that way? I don't know. <laughs> I know that the way it worked was they figured it out that if you were two, three, four, five and up, no healing happened for you. You had to be the first person to touch that pool. So that means when the angel came and touched that water, they, as much as they could, they made a mad dash for that pool. So when Jesus came along, that man said, Lord, I've been here for 38 years. Now, Bishop Jake said you could have crawled to the pool in 38 years, which is true. But anyway, that man said, Lord, I've been here for 38 years and no man can take me to the blah, blah, blah. And the Lord said, that's not what I asked you. Lord, I said, do you want to be whole? Do you want to be healed? 
And he said, I will know about it. And the Lord said, then take up your bed. He spoke it. So the point I'm trying to make there is that genie concept, this is why I do this teaching. Okay, but I really want you to watch the first video because I spend most of the video explaining it. But genie concept is that thing that makes people go to the extreme, that makes them not even actually read the word of God, but they kind of frame an imagination in their heads and they say, it has to happen this way. That is our genie concept is in the Bible for you to know that. With the man Naaman, Naaman was a Syrian Old Testament and Naaman was a mighty warrior and never lost a battle and had a very strong reputation in his day. But Naaman had a patch of leprosy on his body and there was no human cure for leprosy. And it was the thing he was most ashamed of that the mightiest warrior in the land was also a leper. So he wanted to go to Elisha to get healing. And so he did. When he went to the man of God to get his healing, do you know what Elisha did? Elisha didn't even come out to tent. Elisha sent his servant and said, go tell Naaman, go wash in the river seven times, in the dirty river, go wash in the river seven times and you'll be whole. And Naaman got so mad, he said, forget it. He's like, forget this news. I thought he was going to come out and do something big and dramatic and wave his hand over my leper spot. And Naaman thought it was going to be like this big thing. And that's not how it happened. And Naaman was willing to turn away from that and give up his healing because he was so proud and stubborn. He was so convinced that it had to happen a certain way. That is genie concept where you think you can just pop your fingers and make God do what you want him to do as if he was a genie. All you have to do is rub the magic lamp. All you have to do is say the magic word, sim salabim or abracadabra or whatever you think the magic words are. And then you think that somehow God is there to serve you and no, we serve him. Now he gives us all kind of benefits for serving him, but it's very important that you understand that God does what he does by covenant. And he gives benefits to believers by covenant. This is something that unbelievers, sinners, and carnal Christians do not understand, that the blessings of God are not automatic. I said it last time. This isn't the teaching for tonight. I'm just explaining genie concept to you. For those of you that it's your first time watching me teach on this subject, <clears throat> there uh, are a lot of myths that, because uh, I know I'm talking to people from all around the world because I talked to a lot of people from Africa and I had some friends in Sweden. But for those of you that are in America, there's a lot, there are a lot of myths that we uh, raise our children with in American culture. One of them is that there's some kind of special protection because you're a woman. That's not true. Another one is that there's some kind of special protection because you're a child. That's not true. Another one is that there's some kind of special protection because you're a baby. That's not true. None of that is true. There's no special protection on you because you're a woman. There's no special protection on you because you're a child. There's no special protection on you because you're a baby. Okay, can I prove that by scripture in life? Yes, I can. If you jump off the top of a building, man, woman, boy, girl, young, old, Japanese, African, African-American, Indian, Native American, Italian, German, doesn't matter. You jump off that building, you gonna fall. If you live in a high rise and you're like 35 stories up and you have a weak banner, a weak balcony, and you're not paying attention to your baby and your baby crawls out on that balcony, hits that rail and goes over the edge, gravity does not look up and say, oh Lord, that's a baby. So let me shut off to avoid a tragedy. That is not how gravity works. If that baby goes over the edge, that baby gonna fall. The end because there is no, in God's physical laws, there's no special protection for you because you're a woman, a child, or a baby. That's just what Americans perpetrate in American culture. That's not true. Can I prove that by the Bible? Yes, I can. When God got ready to destroy the world in the days of Noah, he said, before, he said behold, the end of all flesh is come before me, except the women that are in there. Behold, the end of all flesh is come before me, except the kids that's not in there. When David and Bathsheba committed adultery, uh, David got Bathsheba pregnant, tried to pass that baby off as Uriah as her husband, but Uriah wouldn't sleep with her because Uriah had more honor than the king. He said, I'm not going to sleep with, with my wife while my fellow soldiers are out there fighting. So then David had him killed. After the funeral, he moved Bathsheba into the palace and they got married and she had a baby. Okay. 
uh, Nathan, the prophet of God, sent by God to tell David of his sin and that all, all that what he did was wrong. And then he said, and the child that is born unto you, that child shall die. And David fasted and prayed and fasted and prayed and fasted and prayed and that baby died. And the Bible says that the Lord struck the baby so that the baby died. Now, I know uh, in the Hebrew, uh, many passages in the Old Testament in English, they look like God caused something. They look like they're in the causative sense. But many times in the actual original language, they're in the permissive sense. So in other words, God allowed death to come upon the child. But either way, God is sovereign. So any way you want to put it, if you think that God caused COVID or you think God allowed COVID or any way you want to put it, God is sovereign. It wouldn't be happening if the Lord didn't say so. Let me put it that way. So the Lord uh, caused or allowed that baby that they conceived in their affair to die because there is no special protection on you just because you're a baby. That's a myth. That's what I mean about genie concepts. So carnal Christians, Christians that are not in the word, and sinners and unbelievers don't understand any of what I just said. So when a tragedy happens in their life, when the devil brings tragedy, sickness, tragedy, accidents, uh, anything like that, they say, why God? Why? How could God let this happen? You have no covenant with God. Believers have a covenant with God. Believers get to claim Psalm 91, that he gives his, his angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways. They bear us up in their hands lest we dash our feet against stones. Believers get to claim that. Now, I don't believers, people that actually have a covenant with God. God works by covenant. It's a contract, just like a contract you have in your life. What would you look like going up to an office building before the pandemic? Because now we work at home. But what would you look like going up to an office building and saying, give me a paycheck? Maybe like, uh, security? Oh, we got a crazy person at the front desk. You want to talking about give me a paycheck and you don't work there. If you don't work there, you have no contract with those people. You have no right to demand a check. Do you see how easily you understand that? That's what a relationship with God is like. It's by contract. It's by contract. You don't get to claim the promises of God if you are not saved. This is what sinners don't understand. That's why they get so mad at God. The devil says, if God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? If God is so good, why he let this happen to you? And that's the devil that did it to you. He trying to make you hate God, the one that can actually heal you, the one that actually has redemption in his contract. But it comes through Jesus. It comes through Jesus Christ and it comes through faith in Jesus Christ. God has requirements for his contract, just like any other contract. And it will not work automatically. And it doesn't work by magic because he's not a genie. So that's why I do this teaching because there are so many people that have lost their lives and lost the lives of their children because they believe they could just pop their fingers and God's gonna do this and God's gonna do that as if he was your personal genie. Well, this ain't supposed to happen and that ain't supposed to happen, really. And when you say stuff like that, you talk as if you're in control. Before it's all over, both saint and sinner alike, God Almighty will show you that he is sovereign. We might have dominion over the earth, but he retains sovereign rights. He's sovereign over everything that he created. He's the king of, king, and, and king of kings and lord of lords, and he has the title deed by everything he created by creation and redemption. What do I mean by that? God has the title deed over everything as God because he created it, and Jesus has the title deed over everything as both man and God, because he redeemed it with his blood. So in other words, Jesus paid for it. That's why he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's why he has the keys of hell and death. That's why he's sovereign in heaven, sovereign in earth, sovereign in hell. There is no name higher than the name of Jesus because the Lord literally paid with his life's blood to establish what we call the new Testament or the new covenant or the new contract. So God is sovereign over everything he made and everything he redeemed. And if you think you in control and you walk around shooting off your mouth like you in control, God will show you before it's all over that he is sovereign and he's in control. That is why genie concept is so dangerous. That's why it's so dangerous. That's why I preach and teach and prophesy so hard against it. Because you cannot be running around here thinking that God is your personal genie, that you can live any kind of way you want to and then just pop your fingers and God has to move on your behalf, 
or if you haven't done what the Lord told you to do, if you haven't done things the way the Lord told you to do them, because God always requires a faith. I like the way Marilyn Hickey says it. Marilyn Hickey says the uh, word of wisdom, excuse me, the word of knowledge is a fact you didn't know. And the word of wisdom is an act you didn't know. So God will tell you how to think and then God will tell you what to do. But you have to be thinking the way the Lord told you to think. Then you have to do what the Lord told you to do. That's the way God's contract, work, contract works because it requires faith. Can you see that? Samson was a man of God and then he got out of contract with God. God made a contract with Samson before he was born that he was going to be a Nazarite from the womb. That means he could never cut his hair. It means he wasn't supposed to drink wine and strong drink. And it meant he was set up by God to be a judge against the Philistines. He was to judge Israel on behalf of God against their enemies, the Philistines. And that's why Samson had that super strength. He fooled around, got hooked up with Delilah, eventually told Delilah what the source of his strength was and Delilah cut his hair. He broke his contract with God. Then his strength left him and he was helpless before his enemies because he got out of contract. Can you see it? That's the way it works. That's the way it works. And if you don't like that, then you are free to spend the rest of your life trying to make it work the way you think it should work. That is what most people do. Most people spend their lives trying to tell God how all this creation is supposed to go. Oh, no, God, it don't go like that. This is supposed to be this, and that's supposed to be that, and that ain't supposed to happen to me, and this, and I should have been here by this age, and this, and this, and that. That's what most people spend their lives doing, trying to tell God how it's supposed to go. You don't get to tell God how it's supposed to go. Some of us are on our second and third and fourth and fifth chances, our second, third, and fourth and fifth go round. You know why? Because we didn't do what the Lord said do the first time. God opened the door and God gave you a shot. God gave you a chance and you decided to do something else. So if the Lord had mercy on you, he opened your eyes to that and he brought you back around to it again. But you, you know what that means? That means this time around, you got to do what the Lord said do because that's the way it works if you want his blessing. If you want his blessing, you must be found in faith and obedience. If you not, do not want his blessing, then you can do what you want to do and do it your way. And then you're going to have to live with what your way produces. And that's where people get all mad, especially in areas of like money, the stuff we care about the most, uh, sexuality and relationships. We're convinced that things like money and sex and, and relationships are supposed to work the way we think they should work, as if we invented them. But we did not. They ain't going to never work the way we think they should work. They ain't going to never work the way we think they should work. They ain't going to never work the way we think they should work. People, when they accumulate property, resources, and assets, the Bible says there's a deceitfulness that comes with riches, and it can make you think you're more than what you are. What you're going to do if the bottom fall out and the roof cave in and you lose everything you built? What would you do then? Because a lot of people just end it. They just leave it. They can't deal because their identity was rooted in the money, property, and assets because they didn't actually know the Lord. Because <clears throat> if the devil takes away everything, that you built, God can give it all back twice as much, seven times as much. God can restore you. If you didn't go to school the first time, if God gives you years and God gives you another chance, you can go back to school. God can open doors again because you blew it the first time. Okay? That's something only the Lord can do. But he's not a genie. You don't just live any kind of way you want, spit all of his gifts back in his face, just do whatever you want, then just pop your fingers and think that God's going to move on your behalf. That ain't nowhere in the Bible. That's how I know people just made that genie concept. People just made that up. That ain't nowhere in the Bible where God says, just do whatever you want to do. Live any kind of way you want to live and I'll bless you anyway. That ain't, no <laughs> that ain't nowhere in the scripture. That's how I know people made it up. That's why you can't be listening to people that don't have any kind of word foundation. Remember, I told you there's three kinds of words. There's the written word of God, which is the Bible, which nobody in the Bible had. In the Old Testament, they didn't have anything but the prophetic word until Moses, then they had the Mosaic law. In the New Testament, they had all of the Old Testament, but they didn't have the New Testament because they were living it out. So nobody in the Bible had the completed canon of scripture like we do, the written word of God. What they had was their own relationship with God, which is number two, the living word, and number three, the prophetic word or the rhema word. That's what people in the Bible had. We have all three. We have the living word, Jesus, 
the prophetic arena word, the prophetic word that comes out of God's mouth, and we have the written word, the Bible. We have all three. Because remember, when Jesus confronted the devil, he said, it is written. He used the scripture. That's the living word using the written word on the devil. That don't tell you nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to have all three levels of word because as soon as they, as soon as they started writing it down, they started using scripture. It is written. So you got to have the written word, the Bible. You got to have the living word, which is Jesus. And you got to have the rainbow word or the fresh breathe word of God that comes out of his mouth right now that normally comes through the prophetic. Okay. <clears throat> and that's why people that say they don't believe in the prophetic and there's no such things as apostles and prophets today. And all the things that people that fight against the apostolic and prophetic say, they will never get the full blessing of God on their lives in this life. And when they stand before God in judgment, they're going to feel salty because God's going to show them everything they could have had in this life. Don't you know, distilling my topic, I'm on my way to my topic. Don't worry, I'm going to get there. Don't you know that God has been talking to us about COVID since at least last summer? But I personally know some prophets, but God talked to them about what's going on now back in 2018. And then God showed me some stuff back in 2014 because God saw the race war coming. The race war that we're dealing with right now, God was talking to us. When I say us, I mean the body of Christ. God was talking to us about that in 2014. Did you know that? God was prophetically trying to prepare us for this race war. God knew that all this racial tension was coming and he tried to tell us back at the end of 2014 what to do. Did you know that? So that's what I mean when I say it works the way the Lord says it's working. He says it works and he said five. He said apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, and teachers. So that means if we walk in that office, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, we got to come with the written word. It is written. We got to come with a personal relationship with Jesus. What is the Lord saying? And we got to come with the rhema, the prophetic word. And you can't be listening to people that just make stuff up. That's why even when the Holy Ghost gives me a prophetic word, I tie it into the scripture foundation. So you can see I'm not just making that up. You can't be listening to folks that just make stuff up. Okay. All right. Having said all that, I will now move on to what the topic is for the prophetic word is tonight for the no more genies. But I needed to give you that foundation. For those of you that are looking at me live for the first time in this topic, No More Genies, and for those of you that watch the replay on Periscope or Facebook or YouTube, or for those of you listening to me on the podcast, that's what I mean when I'm talking about a genie concept of God, this magic concept that says you can just do whatever you want and then just pop your fingers and God will answer you. That's not true. That God's protection and promises and provision are automatically conferred upon you because you're a human or a woman or a child or a baby. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. And when you see accidents and tragedies and stuff like that, that stuff like that happening, that's the devil. And you've got no protection against the devil apart from Jesus. The end. And if you're out there up against Satan on your own, that's why he keeps defeating you and taking you out because you have no chance to be Satan in your own name. Okay. All right. So we're going to say a word of prayer and we're going to dive in tonight. So God, I thank you for this No More Genius program. I thank you, God, for a chance to minister your word, oh God. So God, I surrender. I put myself on the cross and I ask you to take the ascendancy. I must decrease so you can increase. Fill me with the Holy Ghost, oh God. Forgive me for any sin or any hindrance. I breathe that out right now. And I breathe in your precious Holy Spirit. Speak through me, oh God, my hand gestures, my mouth, my, my teeth, my tongue, everything I say. You walk in me, oh God. You let be said what you want said so that your word can go forth, so that you might be glorified in all things, and so that the, the saints might have a chance to be edified. And so anybody that's watching me that's an unbeliever will be challenged to know you and to turn from their own way and to get to know their creator, savior, and redeemer. And it's in Jesus' name I pray and I thank you. And I'm expecting great things in this teaching. Amen. 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 All right. The No More Genies topic for tonight, the, the prophetic word topic is moving. What'd you say, Prophet Taylor? I said the word is moving. Now, for those of you that don't know what that means, many times the Holy Spirit will give us a prophetic utterance in many, many different ways. Sometimes the Holy Ghost gives you a word. Sometimes the Holy Ghost gives you a scripture. 
Sometimes the Holy Ghost gives you a color. Sometimes the Holy Ghost gives you a sound. Sometimes God speaks to you in a song. Sometimes uh, God can can say, because uh, we, uh, my pastor apostle taught us how to prophesy, you know, thou shalt not or thou shalt. So many different ways to be activated in the prophetic. So you can't limit the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you know if it's the Holy Ghost talking? Because it will always come to pass. That's how you know. If God says something, write it down. It's going to happen. That's how you know. If it's from the mouth of the Lord, it will come to pass. That's how you know. Okay? If people just run in their mouth and saying crazy stuff, that's not prophetic. That's pathetic. But if the Lord says something, it's going to come to pass. Okay? So the prophetic word I have to release tonight is called moving. And so the Lord gave me the foundational scriptures. I will not share those with you. Uh, let me put the first one on the screen so you can see it. First scripture is 2 Samuel 7.10. I'll put that on the screen so you can look that up and follow along. And this will also be on uh, the YouTube video. The uh, scriptures are on the screen in the YouTube video. 2 Samuel 7.10. I'm going to read that on a couple different translations. New International Version, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning. At the beginning. New Living Translation, and I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past. English Standard Version, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them, shall afflict them no more as formerly. A Berean Study Bible, I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in a place of their own and be disturbed no more. No longer will the sons of wickedness oppress them as they did at the beginning. <clears throat> Four different translations. So let's break that down. And I will tell you what the Holy Ghost wants me to convey. Uh, God says, NIV, I will provide a place. New Living Translation says, I will provide a homeland. ESV and Berean, Buddy St Berean Study Bible says place, but that word place in Hebrew means a standing, a spot, a condition, okay? A standing place, standing place, machome, machome in Hebrew, a standing place. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, uh, the partial translation is area, country, direction, ground, home, hometown, uh, localities, place suitable, position, room, seat, site or sites, uh, some sort of space, space. Okay, so what that means in no uncertain terms is that God is going to carve out a specific resting and dwelling place for his people, Israel. Why is that important to us today under the new covenant? Because that's the prophetic word that the Holy Ghost is saying to somebody listening to me right now, that you might have been wandering for a long time. You might have been fighting for a long time. Okay, you might have never known peace. You might have never known rest, but God is saying he's about to release even in the midst of this pandemic. God is releasing unto you a place that's carved out for you. And it's not just limited to physical living quarters. What does that mean? That means in your career, God is going to put you in a place that only you fit. It's your spot. That means in your physical living quarters as well, uh, a, a dream place to live. Are you living in your dream space? How do you know if you're living in your dream space? Because when you wake up every day and you look around, it gives you peace. It gives you rest. It blesses your mind just to look at it. Do the walls look like you? Do the decorations look like you? Does the cooking braille look like you? Does the artwork look like you? Is it what you wanted when you, did you ever imagine when you were a kid, have you ever imagined in your life? I want to live here. I want my space to look like that. Well, you're not in your dream space until it looks like that. 
Because when you wake up in your dream space, the very decor will bless you. The walls will literally speak peace to your soul. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Prophet Taylor, that sounds crazy. It's not crazy. It's actually literally true. When you are in your own space, the walls speak peace to you. It's the most amazing thing. And God is saying to somebody listening to me right now that he's releasing the anointing. So now it's your job to believe it, receive it, say it, and obey it. He's releasing the anointing to put you in your own space. And so for some of y'all, that's my own space at last. At last. What's that Eddie James song, at last my love is coming along? <laughs> uh, and also the same thing for relationships. Some of y'all have been wanting a relationship for a very long time. Only God can put people together in a marriage relationship if you don't know that. Oh yeah, only God can do that. That's not something we can do in a natural. That's why people keep trying and failing and trying and failing and trying and failing because only God can actually put two people together in a marital relationship because God is the inventor of marriage. And so for some of you listening to me right now, God is going to put you in that relationship, that dream relationship, a relationship that's all yours. I have discovered something about marriage and discovered something about married people. <clears throat> Nobody wants to get married to be second or third or fourth place. Now, I don't mean above God. God is always first. Nothing comes before God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. Nothing ever comes before God, and anything that tries to is an idol. So I'm not talking about marriage and intimacy above God. God is always first, then you. You got to love you. You take care of you. Then family. God, self, family. That's the proper order. But Nobody gets married to feel like their second, third, fourth, or fifth choice. No one wants to feel that way in a marriage. Nobody wants to feel when they're married like you're an afterthought to your spouse. Like your spouse has all this time, all this energy, all this attention, all this focus for everything and everybody but you. Well, God is saying for those of you that have been faithful, for those of you that have believed me, for those of you that have waited on me, for those of you that have kept the faith and believed my word, I'm about to give you somebody that's all yours. What'd you say, Prophet Taylor? I said, they're going to be all yours. Do you understand what that means? When God brings somebody in your life, he brings somebody anointed by him to be with you. That means they will want to be there. Okay? And it's a difference between wanting to be there and not wanting to be alone or not wanting to sleep alone or wanting some money or whatever other reason people use for relationships. That ain't the same as wanting to be with you. I say it of my children all the time. I say of my children, uh, I have two children, I have a daughter and a son. If God allowed me to be daddy to anybody in the world, if God told me, David, you could be father to anybody that you want, I would still pick the children I have. I would still pick Sunni and David. I would still pick the kids that I have. Do you know why? If I had a chance to be anybody's dad, I would still pick them too. Do you know why? Because it's them that I love. It's them that I love. It's them that I love, not the idea of them, not the idea of being a parent, but them, them as people. It's them that I love and I would not trade them. And I'm very, very proud to be their dad. Do you understand? That's different <laughs> from men who just like to label women and make kids and some men that don't even know their own kids' names and some men that are in love with the idea of I have a lot of children. That ain't the ain't same thing. You see that? Because it's them that I love. And so in your intimate or romantic relationships, you ought to have that kind of relationship. You shouldn't be with somebody and you just a plan B. 
You just somebody they settled for because they couldn't be with who they really wanted to be with. Yeah, no. So God is saying that he's about to release an anointing for a relationship where that person want you. They want to be there with you. So in other words, with all the other options I may or may not have, if I had a chance to be somewhere else, I would still pick you. That's what you want in a relationship. I could go be somewhere else, but I'd rather be here. See, that's somebody that's all yours. That's what you want. Only God can do that. That's why so many people that keep trying, they keep feeling. If you notice that people, they keep trying to make them be yours. Whatever they try to control you or they try to change you or they try to fix you or they try to manipulate you or they try to guilt trip you or they try to shame you. And none of that works long term. Have you noticed that? Do you know why? Because only God can put two people together in a marriage and it work long term because it's a function of your relationship with him. It's literally a function of your relationship with him. It's not a function of your relationship with yourself or that other person. It literally starts with him. That's why only he can do it. And what you want and what you need is somebody that if they could have anybody else, they would still pick you. That's somebody that's all yours. Not somebody who's just with you because they don't want to be alone. That's not the same thing. Somebody who's with you because they couldn't get anybody else. That ain't the same thing. Somebody who's with you, but if they had a chance of a door open and they could like run back to an ex, they would go be with them. Okay, well, that means they don't want you. Okay? So like I said, I say it of my children all the time. If God gave me the opportunity right now to say, I could be father to anyone that I wanted, any famous person, any child. If God said, you can be anybody's daddy, I would still pick David and Sunni without hesitation because it's them that I want. It's them that I love. You understand? It's them that I want. And that's what I mean. God is about to he's release the anointing, as I'm saying, it, to bring someone in your life that's all yours. Okay. Uh, same with your living space. And also, like I said, same with your career. Same with your career, man. You have to hit a point in your career. Bishop Jake says it all the time. Bishop Jake says where nobody can do what you do like you do it when you do it. <laughs> I'm not doing that justice because it's his phrase. I can't do it like he says it, but which kind of proves his point. But anyway, where can't nobody do like you do when you do what you do the way you do it. Okay, you got to get to that point in your career. When people come to you for goods or services, they're kind of looking for your brand. The way you build a chair, the way you fix the plumbing, the way you paint a house, the way you bake a cake, the way you put all those numbers together, the way you do the bookkeeping, the way you do whatever it is that you do, okay? When they come to you for goods or services, they're looking kind of for that brand identity. You know, just like when we have a, our favorite musical artists, you know, when you listen to them because they have a sound and you like their sound and we get really upset when we uh, look at the new video from our latest musical artists and it ain't nothing like what we expected. We're like, what is that? Because we're kind of expecting a certain sound from them. That's why we like them. That's why we follow them. So God is saying he's going to help you carve out that place in your career, that place in your career. That's all yours. That's all yours. So when people come to you, they're looking for your brand of goods and services because can nobody do what you do like you do it when you do it. OK, but you got to believe that and you got to develop that. OK, so God says, I'm going to point a place for my people, Israel. Very significant. God says, my people, Israel, because when God says my people, under the New Testament, he's talking to us, but he was talking to us in the Old Testament. He's talking to believers. OK, those that because God only draws one line uh, among humanity. It's not a gender line. It's not a color line. It's not an age line. It's not an ethnic line. It's not a money line. It's not a geographic line. There's only one line God draws between humans. And here it is. Believers and unbelievers. When God looks at people, you on one side or the other. Either you believe him or you don't. That's the only line that God draws. In all of the Bible, you can see it over and over and over again that even under the Old Covenant, under the Mosaic Law, that if Gentiles feared the God of the Hebrews, God would graft them in. There were Egyptians that came out of Egypt with the Israelites 
in the Exodus. Did you know that? It wasn't just Hebrews that came out of Egypt underneath Pharaoh. Some of the Egyptians left with them too. Uh, Ruth, uh, the book of Ruth. Ruth is a Moabite. She wasn't a Hebrew. Ruth wasn't even a Jew, and she got grafted in the bloodline of King David and Jesus Christ himself. So God is all, even Gentiles, God is always willing to graft anybody in if you believe him. So when God says a place for my people, remember I told you at the beginning of the program, you got to be in covenant with God. You can't claim his promises if you're not in covenant with God. But if you are, God says for my people, he says, I will provide a place for my people. So if you are a child of God, that's talking to you. Believe it, receive it, say it and obey it. Okay, and we'll plant them, oh Lord, and we'll plant them, and we'll plant them. Okay, it says to strike in, to fix, or to plant. What does that mean? That means to get you stable, to get you settled, to get you established. You're not supposed to wander your whole life. Good God Almighty. <laughs> You're not supposed to wander your whole life. You're not supposed to wander your whole life. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, please like and share this video because when a prophetic word is going forth, we want as many people as possible to receive it. You're not supposed to wander your whole life. You're not supposed to wander your whole life and maybe you've done it or maybe you know some people like that. They've been wandering their whole life. They've been wandering, they've been wandering, they've been wandering, they've been wandering here, this here and that here and that. You're supposed to wander your whole life. God actually meant for your time in the wilderness to be very short, but sometimes we get stubborn and rebellious and unbelieving and we end up staying in the wilderness longer than we had to. But God never meant for his people to wander. They whole, if you wander in your whole life, you're still in the wilderness. That's a curse. That's not supposed to happen. God says he wants to plant you, okay? Plant you in a stable family. Plant you in a stable marriage. Plant you in a stable living condition. Plant you in a stable career. You say, how can you talk, be talking about stable career in a time of a global pandemic? Because what God does is he puts the anointing in you. And you take the blessing with you wherever you go. Whatever it is that you can do, it goes wherever you go. So if you're in a place, a, a barren, dry place and dry land, then when you show up, you can take that land and make it fruitful. Isn't that the first thing God says? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, replenish it, subdue it, have dominion over every creeping thing. Ain't that the first thing he said to us? As believers, we don't live from the outside in. We don't live according to the circumstances around us. That's the way carnal people think. That's the way worldly people think. That's the way sidewalkers think. We don't live that way. We live by faith. We live from the inside out. We live from the invisible to the visible. That's our flow. And so when God puts something in you, for example, uh, like when I'm writing books, I have all different kinds of places where I write because the writing's in me. I can go somewhere and write. And sometimes ideas hit me like, one of the ideas I got, I got it when I was on a plane. So I got out my pad. I don't even think I had a notebook. I didn't think I have a journal. So I got on my iPad and opened up my iPad and I jotted because these, these ideas hit me and I loved them. And I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write this. I'm on a plane on my way to the West Coast. And the Holy Spirit gave me some inspiration because the writing is in me. It's wherever I go. You see that? And that's the way we live as believers. So that's how I can say, God said, he's going to plant you. He's going to plant you. Prophet Taylor, are you living that yourself? Yes, I am. The very fact that I'm here preaching, teaching, and prophesying to you, because this is one of the things that I was born to do. That's why I'm doing it. Okay? So in your ministry or your calling or whatever it is that God has you, he's going to plant you. He's got to establish you. Got to establish you. But he will. He said that's what he wants to do. So you don't have to wander for the rest of your life. Okay? Let's move on. Um, that they may dwell in a place of their own. There it is again, a place of their own. There it is again, a place of their own. There it is again, a place of your own. That means it's supposed to be custom designed. Your house is supposed to look like you. Your land is supposed to look like you. Your career is supposed to look like you. Your spouse is supposed to be the right one that fit with you. It's custom designed for you. It's a place of, of their own, which is why you're not supposed to spend no time like King David did with another man's wife. You need to repent. You need to turn from that. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody need to hear that. Okay. If you going with another woman's husband, if you sleeping with another man's wife, you need to leave that alone. That ain't yours. Lord have mercy. That's one of the worst mistakes you can make in life. Don't be over there 
laying with another man's wife. Don't be over there laying with another woman's husband. Let that go. Let that go and claims, uh, claim God's promises and ask the Lord to give you your own. He just said it in 2 Samuel 7, 10. That's why I put the scripture up there so you can read it for yourself. He just told you, I'll make a place of your own. You don't have to go get nobody else's anything. Okay? You don't have to go get anybody else's anything. God said, I'll give you your own. Now, let me hasten to say, just to give you some balance to that, None of that is really going to do you any good if you're not grateful. See, that's the other thing. That's why God works on our character, because we're more concerned about the blessing, but God is more concerned about our character. It's really funny because man is always the opposite of God. That's what happened when Adam and Eve sinned. We got turned backwards. We got inverted. And so when we were created, we were one with God. So when you saw God, you saw us. When you saw us, you saw God. We were an image and a reflection. When Adam and Eve sinned, they detached from God, and then we got flipped backwards. And so that's why everything about being a human is now inverted from God, okay? And so that's why all the things we care about as people are always the opposite of what the Lord cares about. So God is not that God doesn't care about the blessing, but blessings are not a problem for God. How could blessings be a problem for God? God has so much money. He, he pays the streets with gold and he makes his walls out of one pearl. And then he decorate, decorates them with like diamonds and emeralds and like rubies and onyx stones and sapphires, how could a blessing be a problem for God? How? How? How could God run out of money? How could God run out of anything? God can speak a word. God did not say, let there be a sun. God said, let there be light. And God made so much light, he had to divide it into different entities. How? How? Remember Jesus took uh, uh, two fish and five barley loaves, blessed it, break it, and, and had enough food to feed 5,000 men plus their wives and children. So that's anywhere from 5,000 to maybe 15,000 people from a handful of food. How? How can God run out of blessing? Please explain. He can't. We're obsessed with the blessing, but God is focused on the character. Because if God gives you all of this, <laughs> I'm not laughing. <laughs> if God gives you all of this and you are not grateful, it's not going to matter. That was Eve's problem. Eve had a perfect body that was hand carved by God. Eve had unlimited youth. She would always be young. Eve had eternal beauty. She would always look just like she did the day God made her. Eve had unlimited fertility, meaning she could have as many kids as she wanted whenever she wanted, and her body would recover. Eve had a menstrual cycle with no cramps. Eve had childbirth with no labor pain, and I'm still not done. Then God walked Eve down the aisle and gave her a perfect husband because Adam was just like Jesus. And Eve inherited a garden that she had not done one day's work to take care of. Adam was taking care of the garden. God just brought Eve to it. And Eve inherited a planet through no effort of her own. All she had to do was walk down the aisle. And you know what Eve did? Eve said, Tum! she spit that back in God's face and said, I'm going with the talking snake. The talking snake told me I can have more. He told me, you hold it out on me, God, and there's more over there in disobedience, so I'm going with that. And she spit all that back in God's face. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Then she gave the fruit to her husband, talking about, here, baby, bite this fruit. Then he did it, and then sin happened. Didn't happen to the man did it, because men are the head. Eve took all that God gave her and spit it back in his face, and said, later for what my father say, and later for what my perfect husband say, I'm going with the talking snake, because he told me I could have more. Handcrafted body, eternal youth, eternal beauty, unlimited fertility, menstrual cycle with no cramps, childbirth with no labor pain, perfect husband, garden that you didn't take care of, and a planet because you married the top man. Adam was the top man. There was nobody for Eve to trade up to because she married the top man on the planet. And it didn't take but one conversation with the devil. She said, Pum! and she spit all that back in God's face. And she ate that fruit first. That was her problem, okay? She was ungrateful. Do you understand that? She was ungrateful. You better hear me. She was 
ungrateful. She lost that perfect body. She lost her unlimited youth. She lost her e uh, eternal beauty. She lost her unlimited fertility because now women have to have babies by a certain age and then they're done. That's not what God gave Eve. Eve. Eve could live 600 years and have as many babies. She could wait 600 years and have her first set of kids if she wanted to. They had a planet to populate. They could have walked over to Japan. Adam said, I'm going to name this space Japan. And baby, we're going to have some kids here. We fill up this continent. And once some kids grow up, we're going to let them take over. And then we're moving on. She would have said, fine, baby, how many kids you want to have? And still look exactly like she did the day God made her. She was married to a perfect husband. She was married to the top man. There was nobody to trade up to. And she inherited a garden that Adam was taking care of. And Adam was out there naming animals. She didn't do none of that. All she did was walk down the aisle and it didn't take but one conversation with the devil and she spit all that back in God's face. Why? She ungrateful, that's why. Ungrateful, that's why. Ungrateful, in case you think I stuttered. Now, why am I saying that and why is that so important? I'll tell you why. Because when God does all these blessings for you, it's not gonna do you any good. If you're not grateful, if God gives you a good husband, you better be grateful and you better treat that man right. And you better try to keep that man with you until death do us part, like you said. If God gives you a good wife, you better treat that woman right. And you better try to keep that woman with you. I can't tell you the number of people that I have seen get to old age and wish they had a partner. That's somebody I'm thinking of right now. Wish they had a partner, wish they had somebody to help them with their business. Maybe they can still do everything they used to do. Maybe just they don't, they don't feel like it. Maybe they can't do everything they used to do, but one way or the other, they need help with their business. Well, when you put in the years with someone, what happens to them happens to you. What happens to you happens to them. You're invested. See, so, so their best interest is your best interest and vice versa. That's different when you put in those years with a partner. I can't tell you the number of people I've seen get to old age and wish, wish they had somebody there for them. That's what I mean when I say, if God sends that right person in your life, don't be turning your nose up. If God, remember, that's how they miss Jesus. They said he wasn't good enough. That's what kind of rabbi is this? Talking to Samaritan women, hanging around with fishermen and tax collectors, doing work on the Sabbath. You can't possibly be Messiah. They miss Emmanuel, God in the flesh, because he wasn't good enough. So when God does all this for you, you need to be sure you got a grateful spirit. Or else it's not going to do you any good. It's not going to do you any good. It's not going to do you any good. It's not going to do you any good if God drop all this in your life and you are ungrateful. Okay, so that's kind of a counterbalance to all these blessings. I, I, don't, I don't often hear ministers say stuff like that because, you know, we're so busy preaching about prosperity and houses and cars and ooh, get married. Eh, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with the blessing. But I'm saying you need to be sure you ready to handle that blessing. You need to be sure that your character is where it needs to be because it's not going to do you any good. It's not going to do you any good. I have, it's painful as I say this. I've met people that can't have children. I've met people that take their children for granted. And I've met people that take fertility to granted because they have a lot of kids or they get pregnant easy. They father children easy. I met some people that can't have kids. They, they were so sad. It was so sad. They actually wore that childlessness like a shroud. And whenever they came in the room, you could feel the sadness on them. They were so sad. So sad. It's a, it, it, was, it was hard to be around them because you could feel it. I knew one couple where the man was an ob and He was a, a, a baby doctor delivering babies for all these other couples who didn't have any children of his own. Why would I bring that up? Because if God gives you a child, you need to be grateful. I know it's a lot of work. I know it's a lot of work being a mama. It's hard work being a mama. It's hard work being a daddy daddy, but at least you can have kids. At least you can pass on your genetic code. At least the generations of your bloodline will continue for at least one more generation. At least you have it. Some people can't even do that. That's what I mean by being grateful. Don't be like Eve and literally have the world handed to you 
and you tell God, I'd rather listen to the devil. Don't be like that. Okay. Now, let's finish this verse out. And then I got one more quick verse and I'll be done. Dwell in a place of their own, be disturbed no more. No longer will the sons of wickedness oppress them as they did at the beginning. What is God saying? God is saying an end to bondage, an end to Egypt, an end to Pharaoh. You can be free. God wants us to be debt free. God wants us to be sickness free. God wants us to be guilt free. God wants us to be shame free. God wants us to be regret free. I like the way Pastor Bill Winston says it. Pastor Bill Winston says that the blessing of Abraham and, and the name of Jesus, the word of God in your life, is designed to wipe out all traces of the curse. Wow, I remember the first time I heard Pastor Bill Winston preach that, it's so powerful. He said, God does not just wanna bless you, he wants to bless you until there's no trace of your old life. Wow, that's what happened. To, can you back that up with scripture? Yes, I can. That's what happened to Joseph in the Bible. Joseph named his two sons that he had in Egypt once he got lifted up to be prime minister of Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim, forgetting and fruitful. God has made me forget my labor, my toil in my father's house, and God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. That's what God wants to give you is a Manasseh and an Ephraim, forgetting and fruitful. God's blessing wants to wipe out. God said, neither shall the children of wickedness oppress them anymore. That means no more Pharaohs in your life. Nobody else trying to tell you to make bricks without straw. Nobody else tying you to the wheel putting you under the lash, under the whip. No more of that. Debt-free, sickness-free, uh, guilt-free, shame-free, uh, regret-free, free, free to grow and prosper and fill the earth, replenish it, be fruitful and multiply, which was the original mandate. The devil is the one that brings the pharaohs. God said, no more of that. That's the anointing that to see, because I can feel it as I'm talking. Not that it's by feelings, okay? You're not supposed to, it's not based on feelings. But I say that to let you know that, see, when you speak the word of God, the air changes around you. And when you speak by the Holy Ghost, the anointing flows through you. That's what I mean when I say I can feel it, okay? But it's not based on feeling. Don't go by your feelings. Don't misunderstand that. But I'm saying the power of God is in his word. The Holy Ghost releases his anointing when the word of God comes forth. So anyway, so the, the blessing that God wants to give you is supposed to wipe out Every trace of the curse. That means, remember I told you you have to think the way God wants you to think. That means you have to think that way. Okay? The person in the Bible that got it right was Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul started out as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee. He was a religious man. He was a high-ranking Pharisee. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Then he met Jesus and found out that all that stuff he thought was important didn't mean nothing about nothing. And he became Apostle Paul and he ended up writing the vast majority of the New Testament. Well, Saul of Tarsus was a Christian killer. His job was to, because he was trying to shut down the gospel of the kingdom before he knew the Lord. So he had Christians arrested and tried, convicted and condemned and put in jail and executed. And then he met the Lord and the Lord completely turned him around and became Apostle Paul. Well, Apostle Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He fully embraced, that's my point. He fully embraced who he was in Christ. He let Saul of Tarsus go and he fully became Paul the, Paul the Apostle. That's the right way to do it. Uh, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's the right way to do it. Who did it wrong in the Bible was Jacob. The name Jacob means supplanter. The reason Jacob was named Jacob, Jacob is because he was a twin. His father was Isaac. His mother was Rebecca. Rebecca was pregnant by her husband Isaac with twins. Esau came out first and Esau was hairy and red, kind of a wild man, a sports figure, a hunter. Jacob came out with his hand on his brother's heel. When Jacob came out of Rebekah's womb, he had his hand on Esau's heel, those twin boys. That's why they named him Jacob Supplanter. And he ended up tricking Esau out of his birthright. And he had problems with Laban and a whole bunch of stuff. Well, one day God told him, you're no longer Jacob, you're Israel. Kings and nations are inside of you. Okay, but Jacob never fully embraced being Israel. So he stayed double-minded his whole life. He stayed sometimes a little bit of Jacob, sometimes a little bit of Israel. And he ended up cursing his bloodline with double-mindedness. If you ever wondered why the Hebrews were so up and down with God, it's because of Jacob. You can look it up in the Bible on his deathbed. The Bible says 
Jacob sat on his deathbed and Israel strengthened himself. Even on his deathbed, he, was, he still had that double thing going on. He never fully let go of being Jacob and fully embraced being Israel. That's the, that's the man in the Bible that did it wrong. So when God brings you into this new, this new space, that blessing is designed to wipe out that past life. So you need to let it go. You need to be thinking that up here. Whatever you did in the past or whatever was done to you, the blood of Jesus was shed on the cross to cover it. The blood of Jesus was shed on the cross to cover the sins against you. That means stuff that people did wrong to you and the sins you committed. That means the stuff that you did wrong. The blood of Jesus covers both. And Jesus's body was broken. That's what we celebrate when we have communion. His body was broken, his blood was shed and out of his side came blood and water to pay for sin, to pay for the wrong that was done to you and to pay for the wrong that you have done. And so his blessing is designed to wipe out any traces of your old life. That's why if you still talking about what is happening to me as a child and they did me wrong and I didn't know my daddy, you are not helping your situation. That is not what God wants you to be confessing. Confessing your old life. Well, I was not love when I was a child. Well, my mama left us early. Well, I never knew my daddy. Well, I grew up in that, that kind of stuff. Don't misunderstand me. If you got molested, if you got raped, if you got fondled, that's not funny. That's serious. You need healing, but you don't need to live there. You don't have to spend the rest of your life in jail to what some perverted person did to you. You can get healing. You can get healing. You can get healing and move forward and live your life without a trace of life, just like that never happened. That's not possible by man. That's possible by Christ, his word, his blood, his spirit. That's how powerful the word of God is. That's why God says we got to believe it. We got to receive it. We got to say this word is talking to me. You got to accept it in your mind, accept it in your soul. And then you got to say it, got to say it with your mouth. And then that blessing will begin to wipe out the past and plant you in the new. Okay, one more scripture and I'll be done. I want to briefly give you Joshua 24, 13. Joshua 24, 13. I'm going to put that on the screen so you, look at, you can look it up. Joshua 24, 13. Joshua 24, 24, 13 says, so I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities that you did not build. And now you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Okay, English standard. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities that you had not built and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. What does the Holy Ghost want us to discover from that? I'll tell you what. He's trying to tell you that I want to be better to you than you even imagined. I want to give you homes that you didn't build, vineyards and olive trees that could be businesses. It could be streams of income. It could be fruitful situations. There could be some situation right now that God has set up for you, like he did with Joseph in Egypt, where you ain't never seen it before and it's not even your people and you don't even see it coming. And God's going to plant you right somewhere where you get to eat all this fruit. You get to enjoy all this harvest and it's not even something you planted in. God is saying he wants to be better to us than we can imagine, which lines up with scripture that eyes have not seen in your ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things God has prepared for those that love him. So take the limits off of God and claim Joshua 24, 13. Say, God, just don't give me my house. Give me houses. <laughs> give me vineyards and olive trees that I didn't plant because God wants to be that good to you. And this is the last thing I'll say, and then I'll be done. Do you know why people have such a problem with that and such a problem with God? I'll tell you why. Because people keep judging God as if he were man. You think, you think that just because you don't see that kind of love down here, that that means that it's not up there. That's not true. God is better than us. God is God all by himself. He's his own level, his own dimension, his own everything, and he is not like man. So just because no person would do that for you doesn't mean that God won't do that for you one more time. Just because nobody would do that for you, don't judge God by man. You say, Prophet Taylor, I don't feel worthy. You are worthy in Christ. God is not asking you to depend on your righteousness because we don't have any. 
God is asking you to put your full trust in Jesus and his righteousness. And because of Jesus's righteousness, that's what makes you worthy. You're righteous in him. So right now, anybody listening to me or looking at me right now, if you're not saved, you need to get saved right now so that you can come into the covenant promises of God. So I'm going to show you what to do. Becoming a Christian is as simple as ABC. Those of you that are watching me that are already saved, use this what I'm teaching to help lead other people to Christ. Becoming born again is as simple as ABC. A, admit that you are a sinner. B, believe that Jesus is the son of God. He died on the cross for your sins, rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God making intercession for you. And C, confess all that with your mouth as you're believing it in your heart. If you ABC, you can be saved right now. So for those of you that want to get saved right now, I'm going to lead you in the prayer. Here we go. Father, I come before you. Uh, repeat the prayer after me. Father, I come before you. I admit that I am a sinner. I have sinned against you. Father, I believe that you sent Jesus to earth to die on the cross for my sins, and he shed his blood to pay the price for my sin. So Father, please forgive me for my sin and please cleanse me and cover me by the blood of Jesus and make me be born again. And I confess that I believe that you are my savior and my redeemer and I am now saved and a part of your family. And it's in Jesus name I pray. Thank you, Father, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are now saved. It doesn't matter how you feel. It's not based on feeling, it's based on fact, the fact of God's word. For those of you that are already saved, looking at me doing that, use that teaching to help lead other people because it's simple, as simple as ABC, admit, believe, confess. That's what it takes to be saved. Don't be listening to these people tell you, you gotta jump through all these hoops, all the people that told you you had to go to church. We can't go to church no more. You telling me that people can't be saved if they don't go to the physical temple? We can't do that anymore right now. That doesn't tell you anything. It's not religion, it's relationship, okay? All right. That's a prophetic word for tonight. Praise God. Thanks to all of you that watched me live. I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost, when you see me close my eyes and speak in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost if there's anything else he wants me to release before we wrap up. So here I go. Holy Ghost told me to say, hold your head up. I received that and I release that to you. Hold your head up. Some of you, that means some of you looking at me, listening to me, been holding your head down. Hold your head up. Okay. Better days are coming. All right. Amen and amen. All right. So uh, my prophetic devotional is available now. Uh, still two months left. Well, we're halfway through August, so uh, a month and a half left, but you need to be strengthening your own prophetic. Okay, let me put that link because somebody asked me last time, where is the link? I will give you the link. <laughs> you need to be strengthening your prophetic. Like I told you early in the program, God has been talking to us about the race war since at least 2014. So none of what's happening now with all the troubles we're having in America with our racial relation issues, Obviously, nothing is a surprise to God, but God has actually been talking to the saints about it since 2014. The pandemic, the global pandemic, we, you know, things really kicked to the next level in March. That's when we went on lockdown. That's when so many different things happened. Okay, God has been talking to many of us about the pandemic since at least uh, last summer, and for some people since 2018. So there's that link to that link to my Facebook page. Um, it's a long link, so I'm not going to put it on the screen, but uh, it's on my Facebook page. You need to be strengthening your walk in the prophetic. Okay, there's three levels of prophetic. There's the basic water level of the prophetic that all Christians are supposed to walk in. There's the gift of prophecy, and then there's the office of a prophet. Those aren't the same thing. But all Christians can walk in the basic level of the prophetic, and not only can we, we're supposed to. So you need to be strengthening your walk in the prophetic. So that's why I put together the Daily Prophetic Devotional, because each day there is a scripture that is focusing on a prophet or a prophecy or a prophetic word or God himself prophesying. And then it's written journal style. So you read the scripture in three different translations. Then you ask the Holy Spirit 
for revelation, then you write down what the Holy Spirit says. Then there's a, a part at the bottom where you can come back at a later date and write down when that word comes to pass and also write down all the things you learned from obedience to that word. Okay, so it's journal style. So you can keep a daily prophetic devotional. That's what that is. That's why I put that together. So it comes out four times a year, uh, January, April, July, and uh, October. Okay, so quarter three is out. Uh, quarter four uh, is for October. And so you need to be strengthened in your own walk in the prophetic. So the link is up there on the screen. It'll also be on my Twitter. And it's also on my YouTube channel if you're not watching me on Facebook. Okay. If you're listening to me on the podcast, go to my website, www.prophetdavidtaylor.org. I'll put that on the screen too, prophetdavidtaylor.org. And you will find everything I'm doing there and you can find links to get the journals, but you need to be strengthening your walk in the prophetic. Don't you want God to tell you about stuff before it happens? Don't you want God to get you ready don't you want God to get you ready before things happen? That's what the prophetic is for. You see that? It's not all prognostication telling the future, but that is a subset of prophecy. The word prophecy actually means to speak by divinely inspired utterance. It means to speak by the Holy Ghost. It does. The word prophecy does not mean telling the future. That's prognostication. That's telling the future. Prognostication is a subset of prophecy. Prophecy means to speak by utterance, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's foretelling, which is prognostication. Sometimes it's telling for, proclaiming what God has said to say, thus saith the Lord. See that? But whatever the form, you need to be strengthened in your walk in the prophetic so that you can get revelation from the scripture, so that you can get your own prophetic word, so that when God gives you dreams and visions, you know what they mean and you can interpret them. So you can understand what it is God is saying to you because God does not deal with all of us the same. He does not deal with all of us the same. He loves us all the same. You know, same Father, same Son, same Holy Ghost, same Scripture. But he doesn't deal with us all the same in terms of the prophetic and how he talks to us. That's going to be individual. That's why you need to develop it. You can't depend on the way somebody else does it. Okay? So I strongly, strongly encourage you to get my daily prophetic devotional and start developing your own prophetic walk with God so the Lord can get you ready for whatever's coming next. Okay? Because I will repeat he talked to us about the race war in 2014. He talked to us about the pandemic, at least since last summer, summer 2019. But some people were on it back in 2018. That's two years out before this thing began right now. You understand that? All right. All right. Amen and amen. Thank you so much to those of you that watch me live. Uh, now, you know, I know I don't do this for money, but if you want to sow into my ministry, uh, whenever you uh, get blessed by a man or woman of God, then if you have an opportunity to sow into their ministry, uh, then you should do so. And then whatever blessings are on their life, their mantles fall on you, whatever you sow into. So that's another way to begin to get the prophetic to flow in your life is when you sow into the life of a prophet. So I will put my uh, cash app up there if you want to bless me. Okay. So my, my cash app is uh, coming up and I'll put that on the screen as well. Okay. So thank you so much for those of you, again, that listen to me live. And God bless you, those of you that are listening to me on the podcast, those of you that are watch, watching the replay. Uh, praise God. You know, I always count it an honor to be uh, used of God to release the prophetic. And I'm so happy to share with you. And I want to encourage those of you that God has called into ministry. Take up your ministry call. If you're an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, bishop, deacon, elder, minstrel, psalmist, whatever you are, do what God has called you to do. It's not just a blessing in it for you. It's a blessing in it through you and on your family for generations to come. Okay. All right. Amen. And God bless. I will be back on Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for my next weekly live prophetic word. This teaching only happens once a month, second Thursday. So I won't be teaching No More Genies again, again till next month until the second Thursday in September. But I'll be back with my live prophetic word on Sunday. 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I'm getting some new music together. I can't wait to drop this new music. Uh, I put it all together. I even put my, my album cover, my CD covers together. I did the artwork and everything in, in Photoshop. I'm so excited about this new music. I can't wait to release that as well. 
So I got a lot of things going on. So when you saw into my ministry, it's going towards ministry projects. So, but thank you so much. So, uh, so I will see you Sunday, 2.30 PM Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Okay. Amen. God bless. Have a good Thursday and have a good rest of your week. Oh, thank you. My sister always has such kind words for me. My sisters, I, I love my sisters. I got two sisters. I love my sisters. I just I just love them. I just adore them. And my sister uh, just said some really kind words uh, to me there. And that just blessed my heart. I really appreciate it. All right. Amen. God bless. I will see you soon.